Good morning. Good morning, Curtis. Uh, glad everyone came here today, and uh, it is a nice day, and it's a warm day, so I just thank everybody to come into the house of the Lord today. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and pray for a minute. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity that you have given us today. We thank you, Lord God, that you want to tell us something and you want to inspire us to continue to love you. God, thank you for meeting our needs. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us health today, even us that are still dealing with health issues. God, we thank you that you're helping us and we continue to believe what you want to do in our lives. And we thank you for your holy word and your Holy Spirit. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> we have been talking about cooperating with God. And the pastor, uh, Brian, has been preaching on it. And Angie spoke last week about the resistance that comes along with some of that. So we're going to still be in that format. And we're going to uh, ask today... God three questions and we're going to let him answer those questions through his word that we believe he will give us the answer and then toward the end we're going to ask one more question that's not meant to actually uh, give an answer to it it's for you to think about and for you to personally uh, answer that to God and we are going to uh, know that God is going to help us and meet our needs. Phyllis, will you go ahead and read the first? First, let me ask the question. The first question is, God, do you have a purpose for us? Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Now the background of this is Jeremiah being a prophet and God is dealing with the nation of Israel. And specifically, uh, I believe Judah and uh, Israel have split. So one is tribe is called group is Israel. The other is Judah. And God has allowed one group to be actually captive by a king. And they're in captivity for having idolatry and other things they did that was unpleasing to God. So he allowed some enemies of theirs to capture them. And God sends Jeremiah to speak to the, the nobles and some of the uh, wealthy people that are in this captivity. And he's telling them that even though you're in punishment, I still have a plan for your life. Now, that's just not for the people at that time. That's for every believer even to now, God still has a plan for your life. And he's able, even in the midst of your ignorance or in the midst of you outrightly rebelling from what God wants you to do, he's still able to bring you to that point and allow that purpose that he has given for you to do, he's able to bring it to pass. Now, he wants you out of your love and out of your trust to partner with him to accomplish these goals that he has for you to attain. And it's like God understands that there's an enemy and it's the kingdom of darkness that is led by Satan always trying to comfort or go against the plans that God has established. And he started off with Adam and Eve, and he's been at it ever since. And God is allowing him. We're not sure all the reasons why. There are some reasons God gives to why. But God is allowing him to do this. At the same time, God has made a provision for us 
in the middle of those attacks and those situations that we have. I, I want to ask the second question. God, will you help us obtain that purpose or those goals that God has? We'll let God answer that. Romans 8, 29 to 39, and this is out of the message. God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. The son stands first in the line of humanity he restored. We see the original and intended shape of our lives there in him. After God made that decision of what his children should be like, he followed it up by calling people by name. After he called them by name, he set them on a solid basis with himself. And then, after getting them established, he stayed with them to the end, gloriously completing what he had begun. So what do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose? If God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there anything else he wouldn't gladly and freely do for us? And who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of God's chosen? Who would even dare to point a finger? The one who died for us, who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment sticking up for us. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There's no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in scripture. They kill us in cold blood because they hate you. We're sitting ducks. They pick us off one by one. None of this phases us because Jesus loves us. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our master, has embraced us. Now, that is coming from a letter that God, uh, God used Paul to write to the Roman church. Now, one thing to consider about the answer where God is saying, yes, I will help you, is that Paul is sharing his experience of knowing that God is with him and he, not like the other 12, he never really got to meet Jesus in the natural. He, wa he was around, but he was not a part of the original 12 that walked with God, was a part of his everyday life. As a matter of fact, he was on the other side of that. He was a believer in the sense of believing in God. He believed in the laws very strongly. He had studied. He had committed his life to worshiping God the way he felt and thought God wanted to be worshipped. To only find out later that Jesus was the Messiah and Jesus was here for him that Paul recognizes that he had made a mistake. God literally met with Paul on a road and he gave him an a experience and God told Paul that you're going to serve me and that you are going to suffer a lot of things for my name. So Paul spent the rest of his life from that point on studying and trusting God and he did go through a lot of abuse and a lot of torture, hunger, all those things. So he's understanding with conviction as he says these things. These are not just things that he's hoping for, but these are things that he's actually has been experiencing and he's in prison right now for doing what God told him. Yet he says, God is with me. This is the purpose that God has called for my life and I'm embracing it 
Even though, yes, I'm hungry, yes, I'm cold, yes, I'm hurting from the abuse and things that people, but yet he seizes the opportunity to allow God to use him and let the words that God has find a place in the hearts of the people that he's given them to. God allowed Paul to talk to the highest level of authority of the Roman government at that time. He got a chance to go before Caesar and speak to those people that was in that court and, and in that upper part of government and share the gospel. Right, but God still used Paul to able to do that and it cost him uh, punishment and different things to get to that point to be able to share to the point that one of them come under such a conviction from God, he says, are you trying to convert me over? Paul gets excited and says, absolutely, that's what I'm trying to do. So here, God is allowing for his purposes to be met through an indivisible, and this person is embracing it. Now, on us today, each one of us in this room, God has a purpose for us. Now, it doesn't mean that that purpose may be connected right to preaching. It doesn't mean that that uh, purpose may be connected to Bible study. But it's just as valid you washing windows and having a job and being put in a place to share the hope of God in your life even when you're not working and you're waiting on God to do something, there's still people in your environment that God wants you to talk to. He is helping you. He's encouraging you. If you see that, now, you can be caught up in the dilemma that you find yourself in. That's very natural. But at the same time, do you understand who you belong to. That's what Paul did. He understood who he belonged to. So therefore, he knew that nothing was going to happen to him unless God is willing it. It is not up to me to accept that because I like it or dislike it. It is up to me to embrace that I'm in his hands and whatever he does with me, he's doing it with the idea he wants me to succeed in that. He is not doing it so I will be full of fear. He's not doing it so I won't be able to accomplish that. He has already seen the beginning from the end and he knows that you are going to yield to him and he is going to get the opportunity to let you know how much you mean to him and how he is your provider, how he is the one that brings you peace. If some of these things doesn't happen in our lives, how do we know that he is the provider? How do we know that he's able to make a good thing be better or a bad thing turn around and be a good thing. When we go through these things, if we understand like we as parents or as grandparents or even as friends to people that you really care about and you love, co-workers, family, you know that you have intended to be a good person for them and to help them whenever you can. And when they're feeling bad, you want to be able to encourage them. You want to be able to help them some kind of way. Sometimes you know you don't have the words. Just like Eileen went to a friend funeral. She didn't have the words, but it was the fact that I'm here, sister, with you. I'm here for you to cry and me to cry with you. God put that purpose there. It's not that God caused that to happen, but he put the purpose there so you could come with another hope, another a whole perspective to the problem. And the problem is trusting God. Even when people don't know who God is, there is a realness and a level of peace that you bring because of who you know and where you are in God. And it changes the environment you're in. You may not necessarily recognize that, 
But God does, and he's willing to use that to bring glory to himself and to let that person know, I hear you, child. I hear your pain. Now, God is not making excuses for sin. He accepts that he gave mankind the time and ability to either choose to serve him or reject him. Knowing that they would choose to reject him from the foundation of the earth, God already decided what to do about the situation. And he did it by allowing his son to come here in human flesh and to put up with the abuse and all the things that Jesus put up with so he could justify, take all our mistakes upon him and God wouldn't have to put them on us. So we could come back into fellowship with him and know him and feel a security we otherwise will not feel until you come to know God. So God is definitely here with us and for us. Now, if Paul was able to embrace that, God is also through the Holy Spirit giving us the abilities. And for each one of us that's facing different issues in our life, if we can recognize and look at who God is, and not believe that we have the answer to our own problem, God has the answer. Yes, God does want us to do certain things. Yes, God did want James to go out and look for a work, look for something. But at the same time, God knew where he's going to put him and how it would work. So as we do the things that God wants us to do, doing what we should do, and trust God in it, then we have hope that he will find the answer. And the more and greater the situation is, he wants us to know the more grace, the more compassion, and the more angels and whatever else you need, he will give you to meet the demands of your situation. Now, all we have to do is embrace that and trust that. And go through it knowing at the end of it, I'll be where God wants me to be. And he will help me, hopefully, to enjoy, not necessarily the frustrations, but to enjoy that I know nothing can get in the way, nothing can stop what God is trying to do for me. All I need to do is take it one day at a time and trust him and see what he can do. The next question. If we follow God's will that he has for us, is there a chance that it may fail? Ephesians 1, 1 to 14 in the message. I, Paul, am under God's plan as an apostle, a special agent of Christ Jesus, writing to you faithful believers in Ephesus, I greet you with the grace and peace poured into our lives by God our Father and our Master, Jesus Christ. How blessed is God, and what a blessing he is. He's the Father of our Master, Jesus Christ, and takes us to the high places of blessing in him. Long before he laid down earth's foundation, he had us in mind, had settled on us as the focus of his love, to be made whole and holy by his love. Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure he took in planning this. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift giving by the hand of his beloved son. Because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, his blood poured out on the altar of the cross. We're a free people, free of penalties and punishments chalked up by all our misdeeds. And not just barely free either, abundantly free. He thought of everything, provided for everything we could possibly need, letting us in on the plans he took such delight in making. He set it all out before us in Christ, a long-range plan in which everything would be brought together and summed up in him, everything in deepest heaven and everything on planet Earth. It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us, had designs on us for glorious living, 
part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and everyone. It's in Christ that you, once you heard the truth and believed it, this message of your salvation, found yourselves home free, signed, sealed, and delivered by the Holy Spirit. This signet from God is the first installment on what's coming, a reminder that we'll get everything God has planned for us, a praising and glorious life. In all those things that God is saying, he wants us to understand that his focus of will for what he has for humanity is different than what we see. And from his perspective, which is the truth perspective, he created us to have fellowship with him. And even though there was a spirit world, angels going on, God created another realm of reality to put us in that he could fellowship with us on a level that we could touch and breathe and really commune with him. Different than angels, different than all the other uh, spirit beings that may be around, God chose us to be in our image so he could have a very personal relationship with us. And then when that was broken by disobedience, he went ahead and did what he needed to do to bring it back in full circle. And now that has actually happened, Jesus has actually come to this earth and died for us and sent back, when I say sent back, the Holy Spirit really didn't leave, but he sent it back in a different uh, ability as far as being able to literally live in each person that God wasn't doing then. There were some people God did allow his spirit to be in. But now every believer by faith God wants to literally send his Holy Spirit, come in you and resonate in your spirit and produce his nature in you so you will accomplish the things that God has for you. And you may accomplish a lot of great things. And there are a lot of people who purposely deny that God exists, has accomplished what we think are a lot of great things, and they probably are. Yet, according to God, they miss the very foundation and the very thing that's the most important is having a relationship with God himself. And all those other things will not stand up to the law and purpose of God so they may find themselves in a place where God is not there. Even though we look at things and say, well, this person created this, he, he invented this, he was great, all those things. But in the understanding, the only really great thing is trusting God Almighty and allowing God to be the purpose and focus of your existence. Once you do that, then everything else can fall in place and be used to bless other people and other things. But if it's not in that order, it really won't mount to nothing. And when you stand before God, he's not going to talk about all the great things that you might accomplish unless they're connected to your relationship with him. Then they count. Everything else really doesn't count. So it's being able to understand that God wants me to succeed. And if I trust him, how much more can I succeed? If I'm trusting God, even though there's times I'm not always going to do everything God wants me to do, I'm not going to be able to talk to people right all the time, I'm not going to be able to do everything, even though when I know that I should do certain things, but yet because of the forgiveness that the blood of Christ brings, that is not going to be an issue because I've asked God to forgive me and help me to move on to doing what he wants. So God already dealt with that by his blood. So it's the way God sees it. How can you not succeed if you trust him? If you're allowing his will and his purposes 
to be fulfilled in your life, then how could you not be a success? What could be greater than that? And that's what God wants us to understand and to grab a hold of. Especially in this complicated world that we live in today, and there's a lot of value that you're not anybody if you can't have a diploma or if you don't uh, make a bunch of money. Sure, some of those things are a reality, but they're not the real reality. It's okay to have those things, but keep God above all things. Keep him above all of that and allow yourself to use those things in a way that they bring glory, excuse me, bring glory to God. And we have, I think, a person, not, he's definitely not the only one, there's many, but this one person in our community, which I think is Russell, who's been gifted with certain physical talents to play a sport, and he's constantly giving God the glory and constantly wanting himself to be able to express and share the love of God in every way he can. And we've seen some evidence of how when he feels a need to pray, even in the middle of a conference game, he's not ashamed to fall to his knees and say, God, we need some help right now. And then when he believes God answered, he's not ashamed to say, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and that's what God wants, is for us to be able to come back and say, I done this because of God. I thank you. It's not robbing me the fact that, yes, I needed to practice and I needed to watch what I eat, you know, all those things he needed to do. But he also recognized even if I'd done all these things, it wouldn't mean anything if it's not connected to who I believe in. And he's making it clear that you may not like it, but you cannot separate this man of God from who he is and why he does and believe what he does. That brings glory to God. And that is part of our own personal purpose in life is to bring glory to God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God is doing that. I believe that those scriptures have answered those three questions that we asked through God. There are many more that we could use to help answer those questions. But I'm praying that we now really got a hold of, for me, I want to allow my life to contact every way I can, knowing that God is in control. Knowing that whatever I do is an opportunity to showcase God and what he's doing in me and through me. I would like to ask the last question and then, uh, I do not want you to answer it. It's just something I want you to uh, take and take it with God and just ask yourself this question. But before I ask the last question, I believe that everything that happens in our life with God, once we come to the knowledge of God, is to be an expression of our thanksgiving and our worship and our gratitude of knowing that God himself loves me and I'm important enough for him to be interceding for me and for him to be looking out for me in spite of bad decisions I may make. And I thank God. I'm going to ask the question and then I'm going to pray. The last question I'd like to ask that I don't want you to answer now, do you trust God? God, I just thank you. I thank you, God, that you are using my life and I thank you, God, that you're using everyone in this room. 
I thank you, God, that you are helping us, even though we have difficulties, even though we're waiting on paychecks, even though we're waiting on healing. We're waiting on things that we know you need to do and that we ask that you help us. We thank you for all the things that you have done. We thank you, God, for allowing us to be on this earth. And we thank you that you are allowing us to be the generation that quite possibly will be the generation that will see you come and usher you in. We thank you. We thank you, God, that you are giving us opportunities to share the word. We thank you for the opportunities of loving people, of being able to speak into people when we see people are desperately depressed and confused. God, give us a way in the words to say. God, help us to pray for people that we may not be comfortable talking to, but we can see things aren't right. And we want to pray and we pray with believing that you can touch and that you can change things. God, we thank you. We know that you want us to pray and thank you and pray and ask you to intercede for things that we're not comfortable with, for things that we know that needs to be changed. God, protect our grandchildren, protect our children. God, protect our co-workers. Thank you, Lord, that you have put us in a place that we can share your love, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.